today's presentation is a best practice framework for applying PBPK modeling to pediatric drug development. Next slide, please. Our speakers today are my Sertara colleagues, Dr. Eva Berglund, Dr. Trevor Johnson, and Dr. Karen Roland Yeo. Eva is currently a Senior Director in Clinical Pharmacology and Regulatory Strategy. Trevor is a Principal Scientist at Sertara, and Karen is a Senior Vice President of Client and Regulatory Strategy. Welcome to the webinar. I'll now turn it over to Karen to begin the presentation. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the webinar. So we've got quite a lot to uh, cover in this afternoon's uh, webinar. I'm going to be talking about um, PBP, uh, PBPK modeling in pediatric drug development, uh, and then Trevor and I are going to be uh, covering some case studies with a focus on best practice approaches. And then we're going to be handing over to Eva to talk about um, uh, drug development, but giving a regulatory perspective. So there have been quite a number of uh, publications on model-informed drug development, um, especially over the uh, past few years. And in this one in particular, I think it's interesting to note that uh, in, the, in the approval of 105 pediatric indications by the FDA between January 2017 and June 2019, model-informed drug development was used in 61% of cases. And uh, specifically in these three areas here, informing clinical trial design, dose selection, and also levering knowledge to uh, bridge the gaps. But I think what is uh, important to note here is that in 61%, um, so in other words, all of the model-informed drug development cases, um, POP-PK modeling was used, and in about 30% of the cases, exposure response modeling. It's not clear how much PBPK contributed to these, but I think it is important to note that the authors made the case for using PBPK in model-informed um, drug development for pediatrics, specifically with respect to incorporating ontogenies, DDDI assessment in children, and also for studying complex absorption. So moving on to actually talking about just PBBK submissions, there was another publication uh, that came out towards the end of last year in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. And I think it's interesting to note here, you can see that on the left-hand side, this graph here, the number of submissions that include PBBK are increasing significantly every year. And on the right-hand side, you can see the breakdown of the areas of focus for each of these submissions. And DDIs remains the focus for the majority of these. But also, you can see that in terms of pediatrics, that covered about 9% of the, um, the PBPK cases. But because of the increasing number of submissions, it means that the number of pediatric cases uh, is increasing year in, year out. I think one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the uh, number of submissions, including uh, PBPK, um, you know, is remaining relatively small compared to DDIs, I think, in you know, some respects relates to the uh, status of the predictive performance, or at least the perception of the predictive performance. And in fact, this slide here is just showing the um, a slide that was adapted from Wagner et al. that was initially presented in 2015, and then later in 2000. 2018. I'm not going to take you through all of this, but really what I wanted to focus on was the pediatric side of things, where it indicates that we have some experience, but knowledge gaps exist, and that there's a greater utility in age um, under two years. And of course, you know, certainly in my view, this has changed over the last few years. There have been over a hundred, probably over 150 publications on PBPK modeling in pediatrics over the last um, 10 years or so, with increasing utility across clinical settings, research settings, drug development. And importantly, there have been an increase in the number of uh, submissions to the regulators. Yes, it wasn't captured in the previous slides, but I think we're seeing an increase in the trend now. And I think that's because of an increasing number of uh, publications, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an increasing number of submissions to the regulators, but also um, I think an increased understanding of the utility and application. And I think this is one of the things that I wanted to mention here. I think there's a misconception here that PBPK modeling should 
only be applied in children less than two years. And in my view, this is simply not the case. And in fact, this has been discussed by a recent publication from Alice Kay and Trevor Johnson. And I think increasingly, what we have to acknowledge is that PBBK does have application in other areas other than just looking at less than two-year-olds. And in fact, this is why uh, Trevor Johnson and I put a series of case studies together for this white paper, where we're talking about the application of PBBK modeling, yes, to determine the optimal dose in children of different ages, but also we can assess the effects of disease and age. We can quantify potential DDIs for any age range. We can assess the impact of formulation changes for pediatric dosing, also look at variability, and also uh, look at uh, clinical trial design for pediatrics. And so what Trevor and I are going to be doing is talking about a number of these uh, case studies just to show the utility of um, PBBK modeling. So for those of you less familiar with PBBK modeling, just to show this slide that we've shown a number of times over the years, on the right-hand side, we have the PBBK model components where we have the system parameters describing the physiology. And then what we would do is, is collate the data relating to the compound file, integrate it within this PBBK model, and then predict the different exposures in the tissues and also the plasma. We tend to focus on the plasma because that's where we have observed clinical data that we can use to verify the model. But we do capture the exposures in the different tissue compartments as well. And what we can do is have a look at the effect of these intrinsic and extrinsic factors on these system parameters that then will in turn affect the ADME processes of the drug. And what we're going to do from now on is really focus on the pediatric side of things and how incorporating these age-related changes can actually help us in um, with the application of PBBK modeling in drug development. So the first example I'm going to focus is on Voxelator, where essentially we're capturing the both the disease and the age-related changes. I'm not going to say too much about the detail in this slide here, where we're talking about the different metabolic routes. Really, this drug was, you, is, has been developed for the treatment of sickle cell disease. And it's important to note that it's got a very low unbound fraction in plasma. And obviously, because of the utility or the application of the drug for sickle cell disease, it's got a very high blood to plasma ratio of about 33, which means it partitions extensively into the red blood cell. Um, there are differences in kinetics between uh, subjects of sickle cell disease and healthy subjects. But the important thing here is that a PBK model was developed for application initially in adults. It was uh, using mass balance data and in vitro data. And at the time, there were no clinical DDI studies with a drug as victim. So this model was developed and applied to assess the DDI liability in adults. And then afterwards, it was actually applied to, actual, to extrapolate to exposures in pediatric subjects. And of course, this is talking about the PBBK modeling strategy and best practice approaches. And typically what we would do is review the data, uh, in vitro data, clinical data, develop the PBBK model in healthy adults. We would want to verify it using independent clinical data sets to show that we could capture the exposure. And then after this, integrate the physiological changes related to sickle cell disease to capture those disease effects. In this particular case, as the main physiological changes relate to changes in hematocrit and also albumin. But that's not to say that we didn't do an, expense, an extensive literature search to see whether there were other factors that needed to be considered. These were integrated within the model, and then what we did was verify this, the exposures in patients with sickle cell disease, and then thereafter integrate age-related changes to predict the exposures and dose of voxelator in children aged nine months up to 12 years. So this is typically what's done in drug development. You develop a model in adults and then extrapolate to uh, pediatrics just to make dose adjustment recommendations. And always um, it would be, and then afterwards, it, we verify the PBK model in children and adolescents as the data become available. <laughs> 
And in terms of integrating the physiological changes in um, the SIMSIP pediatric model, these are just some of the components that we can actually capture. So the maturation of the renal function, intestinal enzyme ontogeny, changes in albumin and AAG levels, hematocrit changes, liver enzymes, and also organ flows. And what you're saying here, are basically physiological parameters that have been collated from real databases. So, and we've de derived these relationships, integrated within the, them within the SimSit simulator, and therefore we can apply the appropriate ontogenies for these different uh, physiological mechanisms within the pediatric simulator. And a particular note for this compound, because of the low fraction unbound, because of the high blood to plasma ratio, and also the, um, the high proportion of metabolism cleared by SIP enzymes, these ontogenies become quite important. So then, of course, what we would do is apply the pediatric simulator, do the dose projections in pediatrics with um, sickle cell disease. And in this particular case, the adult dose was 1500 mg once daily recommended in adults. And what we're trying to do here is simulate to try and project what dose equivalence or what dose we need to give in these children of different ages that is going to give us the dose equivalent to 1500 mg in adults. And of course, because this drug is metabolized to some extent by CYP304, what we did was consider the SIMSIP and Upreti and Wallström CYP304 ontogenies. And what we came up with was essentially these data here that are represented in this table. And you can see that these are the dose equivalents that we would give on a daily basis if we wanted to attain the exposures that are similar to the in adults on 1500 mg QD. And this is very typical of an application of UK modeling for pediatrics in a drug development setting. In this particular case, the uh, model was then uh, um, verified uh, because some data became available in children aged 6 to 12 years old. And you will note from the previous slide that the dose that we recommended on the basis of PBBK modeling was 600 milligrams. This is what was used in a clinical setting, and these are some data that became available. And essentially, you can see that the predictions um, of are, are, are consistent with what was observed. But obviously, as we know in uh, pediatric studies, the number of subjects is very small. But this was, model was actually reviewed uh, when it was submitted to the regulators, and they indicated that the um, observed data and the simulated data were consistent in children down to the age of um, six. But one of the um, key uh, uh, messages that was given afterwards was that there is uncertainty in the prediction of the exposure in patients younger than six because a, a complex absorption model wasn't uh, built into here and therefore you couldn't capture the age dependent changes but certainly down to the age of six and I think this is what we're seeing more of with PBBK modeling you know we know that there are a lot of drugs out there um, BCS class 2 with complex absorption issues low solubility and this is really where PBBK modeling I think is coming into its own own by integrating this complex absorption module. And in fact, you'll see this with some of Trevor's examples, we're able to handle this um, in pediatric um, areas. The next example that I'm going to uh, go through before I hand over to Trevor is the Plaza Court, where we had a look at the drug-drug um, interaction potential. And for this particular drug here, it uh, undergoes conversion by plasma esterases to the 21 des uh, DFZ, which is then extensively metabolized by CYP3A4. Now, this is uh, a drug that's indicated for the treatment of uh, DMD in uh, patients down to about five years old. But the problem is that obviously in these patients, uh, they will take a number of drugs uh, that could potentially impact the CYP3A4 mediated um, metabolism and therefore it's important to know the DDI liability in children. So this was the typical PBBK modeling strategy that was applied where we were able to capture the um, exposures in adults. A drug-drug interaction was conducted in the adults. This was actually verified using the model. Then we integrated age-related changes to show that we could actually capture the exposures in children afterwards. And then of course the model was applied to predict the uh, DDI and dose 
dose adjustments in children were, and adolescents were recommended on the basis of the PBBK model. So the conclusion from the FDA was that the model, it was verified for the CYP3A4 contribution and was also verified in terms of exposures in children aged 4 to 16. So simulations were run to make uh, dose recommendations and it was indicated here that uh, a threefold adjustment had to be made. And in fact, this uh, PBBK model was used to inform the label. But I think it's important to note that in children and adults, the CYP3A4 mediated DDI was similar um, sorry, in children and adolescents was similar to that of adults. But as we know, this is not always the case. And especially if you've got a drug like this that is mainly metabolized by CYP3A4, the ontogeny in children less than two could result in a different magnitude of interaction. And of course, this is something that was uh, discussed in this interesting publication here, where they talk about barriers and opportunities uh, for assessing pediatric drug-drug interaction. And in fact, they cite this paper that was uh, published by my colleagues Amin Rastami, Trevor and uh, Fazana Salem where they actually where they um, indicated what the differences were in DDI liability in pediatrics versus adults and you can see that in some cases this was different and therefore this um, Salerno et al, what they did was they recommended an integrated approach, still using PBBK modeling, but a, an approach similar to what we use for Duplaza court. So in other words, you develop, you verify your model in, um, in adults, make sure that you can capture the DDI in adults, but then you apply it and you can go through this iterative, iterative procedure throughout the um, the drug development process when you're doing pediatric trials and also post-marketing, but integrating this with pop modeling and also real-world world data. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to my uh, colleague, Trevor Johnson, who's going to be talking um, mainly about formulation bridging in pediatrics. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Karen. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm, I'm really going to sort of take you through two cases that I've been involved with. The first one was uh, on Infocort and Chronocort, which are, are both hydrocortisone or, or cortisol formulations. Uh, and this is really about um, bridging formulations in, in pediatrics. Obviously, uh, <clears throat> different pediatric specific formulations are quite important at the moment and, and, and <clears throat> sort of a topic of, of research. So, so why did we uh, and why did the, the company I was involved with want to sort of develop new hydrocortisone uh, formulations in children? Well, this, this this was one of their graphics that illustrates why. And these are these are sort of extemporaneously made hydrocortisone capsules in a pharmacy. Uh, you can see just visualizing them that there's a lot of variability in this formulation, and it's basically an unacceptable uh, hydrocortisone formulation. <clears throat> so. The two formulations that, that were proposed, and actually uh, this one now, Al Kindi, has got a marketing authorization. So this was a, basically a taste mask ma microparticular uh, formulation of hydrocortisone, where it's convenient to split open the capsules and put the microparticles onto a spoon, say, so that the uh, young uh, neonates or infants can take the dose easily. Uh, prior to this, they were, they were either having to take the extemporaneously prepared capsules vis-a-vis uh, -vis the last slide, or we're having to cut up hydrocortisone tablets and, and crush them down. So obviously there was a need for this formulation and also a need to make it taste masked as well for the for the uh, uh, neonates and infants. Second formulation that, that we uh, did some modeling on, so we did PBPK modeling on both of these, but the second formulation was uh, developed really for, for mimicking the diurnal variation in uh, hyd hydrocortisone uh, for adult patients. And what I should say is that both of these formulations are, are geared to subjects with uh, some sort of adrenal hyperplasia. So, so it's subjects who are not really producing enough, either non or not enough hydrocortisone or cortisol for their own body's needs. So uh, that's, that's why they developed these two formulations. So we were asked to do some PVPK modeling on both of them. Uh, <clears throat> this is quite a, a complex, complex graphic really but it, it really illustrates you know our approach to to developing the model so at the top of the screen we, we basically collated all the data and for a lot of these um, 
pediatric simulations where we wanted to go into children, we got, we, you know, use best practice and got the modeling working in the adult population first. So the first thing was we, we basically looked in the, for clinical data for IV hydrocortisone in adults, got the model working with that. And then we went on to look at the oral dosing uh, in adults as well and got the model working with that. Obviously, we're dealing with two different formulations here. So we had to consider how, how to build in the absorption models properly into this. So um, I'll come on to that in, in the next slide, but the, the, basically the, the InfoCourt model um, was then developed based on the specific uh, infant formulation. Again, we started developing the model in adults uh, because they did some clinical trial work in them. Um, and, we, and we verified it in the adult population before we went into the infant population. In terms of the absorption model, we had a release profile for that, so that did make it slightly easier for us. For the after we'd done the infocort formulation or the instant release taste mass formulation, we then went on to look at the chronocort formulation, which uh, was a specially designed uh, sustained release formulation to mimic this diurnal variation. And again, we developed it for the adult population first before moving on to pediatrics. So all the InfoCourt side really was very part of the verification for this Chronocourt model because we did have some clinical data in the infant population, which I can show you. And basically the application of this model was to, to look at <clears throat> what the exposure for this Chronocourt formulation was in the uh, tw 12 to 18 year old subjects. So we had some verification data in adults as well, which I'll show you shortly. <clears throat> so not going through all the details, in, <clears throat> not going through everything in detail, but there were some key PBPK input parameters, firstly for the absorption model, and then secondly for the elimination model. So things like biomediated solubility, it's a fairly modest effect for hydrocortisone, but we did manage to build that into the model, and it did mimic the uh, um, the published data on that. And likewise, the permeability, um, <clears throat> there was some evidence that uh, permeability changes uh, per segment in the uh, GI tract for hydrocortisone. And there'd been some work done by uh, Hans Lenniness's group on this, I think using the Lockheed Gut system. And we were able to use our MEC-PEF model within the simulator to actually predict those regional differences in permeability. So for the IR formulation, the InfoCult formulation, we used a release profile. And for the MR formulation, we, uh, <clears throat> we it was an enteric coated formulation and we had a triggering pH of 7.2. So obviously hydrocortisone is quite a complex metabolism. Um, so the elimination was quite challenging. There's, there's a lot of data on, on sort of hydrocortisone elimination in the uh, endocrinology type literature. So that's what we used. And we were able to sort of, uh, established that the fraction metabolized by the, the the main sort of elimination enzymes for, for, for hydrocortisone, and they're shown here. Uh, one of the other challenges was the protein binding. It's bound to albumin and also to a cortisol binding globulin. And actually, this leads to some non-linearity non in the, 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 the PK of hydrocortisone with dose. And we were able to capture that by introducing the, the KD for both albumin and cortisol binding uh, protein. So uh, obviously the, the PK was changed with, with dose because of saturation of the cortisol binding sites. Another challenge was, was looking at the ontogeny of uh, the steroid metabolizing enzymes. But again, there's some uh, fairly uh, extensive literature data from the endocrinology research groups on this. Uh, and they basically uh, use, uh, you, they basically use urinary ratios for the for the um, well the, the cortisone and cortisol and its metabolites and there are various ratios give you an indication for for these various enzymes and how they develop with age. So very briefly, top line here, it, this is all to do with the Infocort or, or Alkindi formulation. Top line is is the ver performance verification for adults. Bottom line is performance verification for pediatrics. And you can say, see across the board that the predictions were uh, <coughs> were good. I mean, probably, if anything, for this, this older pediatric group, it may be that the elimination of hydrocortisone is slightly faster than, than, than we had it. But we captured most of the data 
between the 5th and 95th percentile for the uh, prediction, which is the dark black line. So this, very briefly, is the uh, <coughs> adult simulation for Cronacort. So again, we're capturing a lot of the clinical data uh, with, with the uh, mean and 5th and 95th percentile predictions. And then we went on to um, <coughs> look at the 12 to 18 year old population compared to adults. So the 12 to 18 year old population here, given these fixed doses, milligram per meter squared of uh, the Cronacort, you can see that actually there's this there's close agreement between the, the, the concentration profile predicted uh, in 12 to 18 year olds and that found in adults as well. And what we, we did to, to finish off with this one is um, we, were, we, were, we then went on to look at uh, real life doses. So this is, this is based on eight milligram per meter squared in the afternoon, four milligram per meter squared in the, in the, in the morning. And uh, <clears throat> what, what we did here, we broke the 12 to 18 year old group down into, into narrower age bands. And um, we also gave uh, the realistic doses. So obviously there are only certain formulation strengths for this drug. So what, what we did here, we, we, we did some uh, dose predictions based on real life doses. This black line, these black lines are the AUC, which refer to the left hand axis here. And the dashed lines here refer to the CMAX, which is the uh, right hand axis. So you can see that giving real life doses, you, you can get a fairly close agreement in, in terms of both PK metrics be, be, between them. Uh, <clears throat> additional um, advantage of this uh, chronocut formulation is it's just twice daily. So sometimes hydrocortisone was having to be given three or four times a day. So that was the first case. This second one is Ridipridol, which is really used um, for infantile spasms. So this is a, a, a rare disease, a sort of orphan disease and potentially life-threatening as well. Um, so it was important that when we took this project on, it, it, the, the, the company we were involved in were emphasizing the fact that um, there was a real need for sort of efficacious doses quite early in the clinical trial because it's, it's quite difficult to recruit subjects. And also the need for uh, to pay attention to, to receptor potential receptor occupancy for the drug to avoid any adverse effects. So again, what we did with the workflow, it's it's the sort of standard practice, really getting it working in, in the adult population first and doing some uh, performance verification on, on it in adults. What we did this time is actually we incorporated uh, some pharmacodynamics in terms of receptor occupancy into the simulation. And then we applied it in the pediatric population to, to establish a starting dose and also escalation doses for a pediatric trial. Uh, and we came up with a a protocol for the trial based on uh, <clears throat> clinical results coming through alongside PBPK predictions. And then in terms of the final models and the, the dose escalation that we'd established, we, th we then um, guided the dose in the final clinical trial. And I'll show you the results for both of these later. Again, I've not really got time to go into this, but it was quite a low soluble drug. So uh, we established the, the uh, fasted and fed uh, the bio-mediated solubility for fasted and fed. We also had two different formulations as well, which we accounted for in the absorption. The other thing was important was the uh, volume of administered fluid was also an important consideration because of its low solubility. Um, <clears throat> in terms of its metabolism, uh, it was relatively unknown, but it was thought to be mainly hydrolysis and some sulfation. Um, but what we showed was that the hydrolysis was not affected by inhibitors of, of various enzymes involved with hydrolysis. And this, this was useful information to know because if it had been some of these that specifically, uh, well, a lot, a number of these have known ontogenies. So we were obviously going down to uh, fairly young children with this drug. It's, it's, it's mainly neonates and infants it's been used in. So certainly carboxyesterases, aldehyde oxidases and peroxinases, there is a known ontogeny. <clears throat> so we we basically because the metabolism was unknown in adults we 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 really um, used the retrograde model to get an intrinsic clearance value, but then there was no ontogeny data. So 
what what the company did actually they did some incubations these are, these are the hepatocyte data and then they looked at them well, the internet, no, no. Uh, no. they looked at yeah. the type of their drug in uh, different age groups of children and basically showed that there was no ontogeny and they used uh, tenacitin metabolism to uh, acetaminophen as a control in this experiment so basically importance of filling in research gaps as part of these PVPK models so this is the uh, escalating and fed doses in adults and you can see the adult clinical data superimposed on the on the uh, simulation results this is multiple doses in adults so then we, based on uh, some in vitro data, we linked it to recept receptor occupancy. Um, and what, what they'd already established using animal models and also based on the PK, of, uh, based on the physico-chemical characteristics of the drug, seemed likely that the free, free blend plasma ratio would be around one. So they measured the, the, the KD value. And they set the receptor occupancies for the clinical studies at starting dose to give 20% receptor occupancy, going up to 40 and then 60%. This 20% receptor occupancy was from previous work done on felbamate in infants, where they, which acts on, a, on the same receptor as, as rodipridil, and they'd shown that you know efficacy was starting around this 20% mark. Um, and we basically the doses were calculated from the uh, unbound average plasma concentration. So what we then established was a, a, a sort of a dose escalation plan based on the uh, early PVPK simulations that we've done. This was without any sort of clinical data coming through the system. So obviously in scenario one where your, your PVPK result matches your clinical data, we then escalated the dose up based on, on uh, the protocol that we, we'd established. If the uh, measured data was higher than the simulated data for the subjects, then we, we'd, we, were, we were sort of looking at, at <coughs> uh, calculating if it's safe to increase to the median dose and then looking at a revised high dose. Opposite way around at the bottom, so where our simulations were higher than the, the measured data, we might have to recalculate a bigger uh, median dose for 40% receptor occupancy and likewise the 60%. So <clears throat> only three subjects came, came through the studies. It, it, it was such a rare disease, and this is Europe-wide. And what you can see here is actually uh, the simulated, in, these are simulated individuals. So this is 100 subjects with the characteristics of the individuals. You can see that actually for all the three subjects at the starting doses and subsequent doses, we actually match pretty well. Uh, in terms of the simulations, which are the lines here, and the clinical data, which which sort of backed up the fact that the measured ontogeny was there was probably no measured ontogeny. So um, that's the, the the two cases that I had to really. This this second one was really for a, an orphan drug um, application. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, the, the trial was abandoned because because on, because of the lack of recruitment of subjects. But it shows how a PVPK model could potentially be linked to a PD model and guide a clinical study as well. So that's the last of my slides. So uh, I'll pass on now to uh, Eva for the last part of the presentation. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the regulatory part of this. So how is PPK used in pediatric regulatory applications? So pediatric drug development has many challenges. We have small populations. We can't use health volunteers. Uh, we are dealing with a developing child and uh, there are other limitations as well. Blood volumes is one that makes us want to use uh, modeling and simulation. And we also need to be as minimum invasive as we can. So the solution to this is to extrapolate, to use all the data that we have at hand and to minimize the data needed in the pediatric population. So this is an outline of how extrapolation of efficacy looks like. So this is based on the EMA reflection paper on extrapolation, but it's very similar in the US guidelines and also in the ICH. So you look at 
um, all the data that you have at hand on similarity in disease, diagnosis, disease course, treatment results, exposure response of other drugs and the same medication, developing on your target importantly, and you consider is it what kind of data do I have to support an assumption that I can extrapolate efficacy? So if I observe efficacy in adults, I can really assume that in children. So based on that, you make an extrapolation approach. So if you can't assume anything regarding efficacy in children, you can't make any extrapolation. But if you can assume efficacy, but you're not sure about the exposure response, then you can go for a partial extrapolation. And you might even be able to say that, yeah, I have good support even for having the same exposure response. I can go for a full extrapolation approach. So if we, okay, back. Uh, if we look at the pediatric development and how it is situated in the full drug development plan, so this is a typical pediatric development starting and in the end of or after phase three. Um, you can also start earlier, in particular if you have a, a big need of having the drug on the market for children. For example, in oncology, you can start already after the adult dose finding studies. But this is a typical outline and here you um, will do your study after phase three, but you start planning early. So you start with your modeling and simulation approach. So population PK modeling and PVPK modeling, populating the model with data as you go along in drug development. And you might also want to look at exposure response or PKPD relationship in adult and compare that to the pediatric uh, relationships. So then you have to also collect appropriate data for that. So you use the modeling and simulation approach to identify starting dose, but also to optimize the size of the study and the sampling. Depending on how secure you are about your PK and also depending on safety, you may consider to use a more stepwise approach where you start with the older children and go successively down in age. And you can also make something called a PK lead-in where you uh, in your first uh, subjects of the study, you have a more extensive sampling and you analyze those before you continue to make sure that you actually have the PK that you want. So this is the basic use of modeling and simulation in pediatric drug development. So it is uh, when you are making the study planning, for setting the dose in the clinical study based on simulation. And you can use both population PK simulations and PPPK simulations. Um, the first based on allometric scaling, maybe with the maturation function if you go below the age of two, and, and the PPK based on PK characteristics and, and what you know about your elimination, for example. So the methodologies can be used alone or combined. Um, and uh, the next time in the basic approach that you would use modeling simulation is when you analyze your data. So you look at exposure and uh, you may also look at exposure response and you want to conclude on the efficacy uh, target range and the full target range that is where you also take safety into consideration and then you want to optimize your dose. Uh, so that you end up in the, with the exposures inside the target range for the full pediatric age or body size population that you're interested in. And here you uh, usually use population PK analysis and exposure response and then covariate analysis support dosing, but you can also use PPPKs to support your dosing strategy in the labeling. And here also you can combine the approaches or use them alone. So we spoke about the use of in dose selection for a pediatric study. And here the PPK has the advantage of being able to look at uncertainties. So take uncertainties into account related to, for example, how your drug is eliminated. 
You can also use PPK for informing your decision whether you need a PK lead-in or not. For, so for example, do you have any absorption issues indication in the pediatric population? Maybe you have some issues in the adults and you want to see how it will look like in the pediatric population. You can also look at differences in disease effect on, on uh, organs that will inf influence PK, for example, the intestine. If you have complex PK, you can look at active metabolite formation, for example. Uh, if you have DDIs with common co-treatments, you can simulate the effect of that. And also, the need, if you have a need to predict the effect of a second intrinsic factor, for example, if you have a fraction that has renal impairment in your pediatric population, maybe you want to look at that. You can also make a formulation bridging if you can establish a safe space. Importantly, one, one use of PPK in the pediatric population is really uh, the situation where you have unexpected findings. So when you have made your PK leading or when you have made your study and you realize that your PK is not at all what you thought that it would be. So what has happened? So for example, if you have an absorption issue, uh, how do you get around it? So can you dose your drug more often? Um, to, mean, to reduce the dose every time, or can you do something with the formulation? So how are you going to sort this out? So this is a good way to understand what has happened here. To the right here, you have the, the more dose, um, the final dose support. So if you have small populations, you might go for a totality of evidence approach where you use PBPK, PPK, and NCA uh, to support the final dose that goes into the labeling. And in this slide, I've also put uh, some regulatory references that can be good to read related to uh, PPK and applications. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about regulatory acceptance and what to think about there in terms of PVPK. So there is two things. It's the regulatory conference in the drug model and it's the regulatory conference in the software. So uh, there are guidelines in EU, uh, in the US and also in Japan on PVPK. And uh, although using sometimes different um, wordings, the, the agencies are quite aligned. So here you need to show uh, the confidence in the drug model by, for example, of course, showing that you can predict the plasma concentration course, but also uh, key parts of the drug model, FMs, for example, fraction metabolized uh, by a certain enzyme, and, th and those uh, information will be important here. Uh, if it, when it comes to regulatory confidence in the software for the type of simulation, uh, there's also alignment, uh, although it looks differently in different places. In EU, it's called qualification. In the US, there has been a white paper published by the FDA stating um, information about credibility assessment. And in Japan, there's talking about validity of system-specific parameters. But in the end, it's very much the same thing, showing that your software is actually able to uh, perform uh, the simulation with adequate uh, accuracy, uh, and also based on the data set that resembles the data set that you had when you were using this. So the level of qualification that is needed and also predict the performance of the drug model depends on the regulatory impact of the simulation. So if you're only going to use the modeling for in-house decision making, of course, you don't need to have any qualification. If you're going to justify study design, including dose, food intake, etc., cetera, um, then you will need some qualification support but you will not need to have make a full qualification because here you are going to confirm uh, the data in your study. If you are going to replace studies, so if you're going to simulate non-study scenarios and also to, when you are reinforcing sparse data for really dosing into the labeling, you need to have a high level of qualification and you also need to have a high fidelity model, so really well-based uh, drug model. So I'm going to uh, now present two applications where PVK was used to support dose. So we have first seen a calcet uh, that has an, an orphan indication. 
a big clinical need and uh, safety concerns in hypercalcemia. Uh, this application was for children down to the age of 28 days, and it was based on quite small uh, num number of, of patients for small clinical studies. Uh, this drug has a high inter-individual variability in PK, and therefore it is dose titrated within a wide dose range. So here the applicant went for a totality of evidence approach, where you have uh, NCA to the left, population PK in the middle, and PBPK to the right. And you can see that if you look at the NCA, you have the adults to the right, and then you have three pediatric populations in different studies. Uh, to the left. So you can see that uh, there are indications that the children are obtaining a reduced AUC, and this is AUC then normalized for dose per weight. The population PK analysis uh, was uh, deemed to, to provide good simulations down to the age of three years, and it was concluded that the exposure seemed to be similar or a bit lower compared to adults. Below three years of age, there were too few patients with too large variability to do any conclusions. So PBPK was used to simulate the exposure in the, in the youngest. But the drug model here was quite crude. FM was well set with the ketoconazole study, but there was also super tumor metabolism, and importantly, there was no data submitted to support the um, ability of the software to perform simulations uh, of drugs metabolized by these enzymes in, the, in this young population. Uh, so in the end, FDA did not approve this, why EMI approved, but then from the age of three years. Second and last example is solifenazin, uh, where and this, was, this was an application for use down to the age of two years, where you can see that uh, both PBPK and the population PK analysis has been done. So PBPK was, do, was used for dose setting followed by confirmation. And here you see the, the mean values and then the 80% prediction interval simulated by PBPK and then the data points. And you can see here that is uh, quite good uh, uh, overlap, although maybe a little bit uh, lower um, data point compared to the prediction, but inside the prediction interval. If you would put PBPK um, simulated AUCs and population PK uh, simulated AUCs in the same plot, it looks like the middle here, uh, where you have the, uh, the youngest patients so between six months and five years old in the red dots. In the blue dots, you have five to 18 years. And, and those colored ones then being PBPK, and then the gray ones is the PBPK. And as you can see, it's quite a nice overlap here. And to the right, you have the simulated AUCs using the two methods on the maximum dose. And here again, it was a very good overlap and, and also showing that the exposure very well fitted inside the efficacy range. So up to 90% of the patients were within the efficacy range. So I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about guidelines. So uh, the pediatric regulations that we have had in place for a while has really have us learning a lot when it comes to pediatric drug development and also about pediatric PK. Um, so uh, there are many guidelines under uh, revision at the moment. So first we have an ICH pediatric extrapolation guideline that is under drafting. This is the, not under revision, this is a, um, a new guideline. We also have the EMA uh, clean form guideline for pediatric patients uh, under drafting and uh, according to the FDA um, presentation on which guidelines that will be come presented this year. There will be a revision on there, also pediatric guideline. And this seems also based on the accelerate meeting oral information given that we will have a pediatric oncology guideline also published by the FDA. So very interesting times. And let's hope that we will see more and more use of PVPK in, in advocate applications. So with this, I'm going to give the floor to Karen that is going to finish off this presentation.
Yeah, so just to uh, finish off the uh, presentation, really, um, just again, uh, you know, some points that uh, we've been trying to make throughout the presentation, really. It just that verified PVK models, you know, typically applied for dose selection and clinical trial design. We've shown you some uh, examples of those, some case studies, and Trevor's shown you examples of formulation bridging. But, you know, I think it's it's important to recognize that it's increasingly being used to assess difficult to study scenarios such as D, uh, DDIs and age related effects. And, um, you know, I think going forward that PVK modeling, it is going to play a larger role in pediatric drug development and regulatory decision uh, making. And but again, you know, I've mentioned this several times, but I think it is important, you know, to carry on publishing uh, on the performance of the PBK models because this will help with the uh, the qualification. And also, um, the the other thing to say as well is that, um, you know, as I've mentioned, there is an increasing number of um, you know labeling examples, regulatory submissions uh, that I'm aware of, and uh, and that are in the process of being published. And so really what we need to do is build up that momentum to get these examples out them, share them, and I think build the confidence in applying pediatrics and hope that that slide that I showed you from the FDA and the GRIO where we had the PBPK for pediatrics as an orange, we need to change that to green to demonstrate that we can do this. But again, it's, uh, it's the publications and the examples from you that need to be uh, shared and put out there. And I think, you know, if we are going to, to, uh, obviously go down this route, which we are, we need to make sure that we have the best practice standards in place uh, and that are supported by industry and regulators. And hopefully that's what's come across in the webinar today. So without any further ado, I'm sorry, we're actually very close to time, but I think that we'll be able to take a few questions um, from, the, uh, from the audience. Great, thank you so much, everybody. And as Karen says, we'd love to see your questions appear. So, um, first question is for Eva. It seems like preparations for pediatric drug development starts early, adding more and more information to the models all throughout adult drug development. The models may not be ready when it's time for PIP and IPSP submission to the agencies. Can you expand on this a bit? Yeah, so, um, the submission of the PIP takes place early to, to EMA and the PDCO. Uh, so you should do that uh, according to the regulation in the end of phase one, but usually, uh, and according to the website, they are saying that you cannot submit uh, when you have started your first day or then you are too late. Um, so, so it's early and uh, you, when you make your pediatric plan, and it's the same with the IPSP as well, that you, you are submitting that in end of phase two. So you don't have all the information yet, but you can outline how you build, how you will build your drug model and which data that you will include in the drug model for the confidence in that one to grow. So, so it's still possible to just map out how you will proce proceed in informing your drug model, even though it's, it's early that you have to write down your plan. Excellent. Thanks, Eva. Um, Trevor, can you comment on whether you considered the interconversion of cortisol to cortisone in your hydrocortisone model? <clears throat> yeah, uh, we did consider it. Um, court, just to clarify, cortisol is the active uh, form of the drug. So that's hydrocortisone or cortisol is active, whereas cortisone is the inactive form. So normally you get this interconversion between the two. But the, the reason we didn't consider it in these subjects is that um, they're not producing any of their own body's uh, cortisol. So uh, we, we subsume the sort of rate of reaction really in, in terms of both of these as just the forward reaction. That was the conversion of cortisol to cortisone. I mean, actually for, for, for patients who are producing endogenous steroids we can account for uh, parent to metabolite interconversion now within the simulator so we could we could develop the model further and incorporate that okay okay great thanks thanks trevor looks like we have one last question um for the radipradol case why did you consider age related age related changes in the pd 
sorry, why, why did we? We actually didn't consider age-related changes in, in the PD in this case, because we were, we were really dealing with quite young children, sort of early infants. Um, the, the, the company I was working with did, did look at this, uh, and there is some evidence that the receptor that Rediprodol binds to, the uh, NR2B, uh, is actually more expressed in the pediatric population. So, so we did the re receptor occupancy based on this particular form of the enzyme, uh, of the receptor, sorry. There is some evidence that actually this receptor changes slightly going into the adult population to NR2A. Uh, and what the company also showed was that in terms of some adult work that had been done on peripheral uh, neuropathic pain, um, that you needed a higher receptor occupancy for this particular form of the receptor. So they had considered some some changes in the receptor, but we didn't really we didn't really incorporate uh, changes in the PD into the model. That that's an area that that we need more uh, research on in the pediatric area. How PD changes with age is uh, quite a focus uh, at the moment. And uh, I know the NIH have had a couple of calls for for. Uh, for, for proposals for uh, PD changes in pediatrics. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, um, Trevor and Eva and Karen. Can we go to the next slide, please? And thank you for, to the audience for your attention. Before concluding the webinar, we have a few short announcements. The next webinar will be hosted by the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, AAPS, and will be on June 17th when Dr. Jasmine Davda will present Clinical Pharmacology in Rare and Neglected Disease Drug Development, Applications to Global Health. You can register for this webinar at the AAPS website and for all other webinars by visiting sertara.com. Next slide, please. On behalf of Sertara, I would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.